and uh, welcome to the NVCA third pep talk. Uh, tonight's pep talk is VTE and she, what every woman needs to know about blood clots throughout her life cycle. Um, we have just an amazing turnout tonight. First of all, thank you to everybody who has registered. Um, we've had almost 400 people register, which is just fantastic. Um, so this is our largest pep talk thus far. Um, I do want to remind everybody that tonight's event is actually recorded. We have not done that over the last uh, several pep talks, but uh, due to high demand for recording, we are recording this one this evening. Okay, so uh, like I said, we have an amazing group of women this evening who are here to share their personal stories uh, with their blood clots along their life cycle. And I would like to introduce you to all of them now. So first we have uh, Kanika Mason. Uh, Kanika is currently a senior medical science liaison covering the mid-Atlantic region where she engages in scientific discussion with key opinion leaders uh, in women's cancers and she is also a doctor of pharmacy. Kanika, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, next up we have Katie Hoff Anderson. Um, Katie is an eight-time world champion, three-time Olympic medalist, uh, two-time Olympic swimmer, and she is the first ever National Blood Clot Alliance ambassador or THROM ambassador, and we are thrilled to have Katie also. Um, next up, we have uh, Heidi Beira, who is a senior policy advisor at Aiken Gump and focuses on regulatory and congressional issues involving health policy uh, in the public and private sectors. Uh, uh, Heidi is excited to be working with NVCA, I hope, uh, representing the Alliance on Capitol Hill in an effort to raise awareness about blood clots and the need, the desperate need, for more education for providers and patients alike. And then uh, we are joined this evening by Dr. Rachel Rozovsky. Uh, Dr. Rozovsky is a hematologist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. She is the Director of Thrombosis Research uh, for the Department of Hematology and she is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. Um, I have shortened up everybody's bio, otherwise we would take the entire 90 minutes uh, talking about everything that you all do. Um, and then myself, are you, I'm kind of old news now. I'm Leslie Lake, and I am the volunteer president um, of the National Blood Clot Alliance. Okay, so um, before we get going, we are actually going to launch a short poll uh, to better understand the risk factors associated with our female patients here tonight. So we're gonna ask that you please take a moment to answer. It'll be uh, quick, I promise. Um, and then uh, Dr. Rosasi, you'll have the, uh, the responses to the poll, which is right here. So if I could ask everyone that's here this evening to uh, take the poll, that would be great. Okay. You feel another 10 seconds to answer it. We'll just give it a little bit of time. Okay. Do we have the results of the poll? Oh, there we go. Wonderful. So not surprising, it looks like about 50% are unprovoked, which is what we typically see in about 40% birth control, about 12% pregnancy, 6% on hormone replacement, 25% with a family history, uh, and about 26% other risk factors uh, that we did not have. Uh, so thank you everybody for sharing that and just thank you for um, actually joining this webinar. I think it's such an important topic. And uh, women in particular are um, at, have increased risk of blood clots throughout their life, really beginning um, at life uh, during, uh, during um, uh, times when they are thinking about birth control uh, to either control heavy menses or for contraception, then thinking about family planning, some people might even need uh, IVF and then pregnancy and childbirth and then treatment of menopausal symptoms. So really uh, a woman's risk of blood clot really traverses her whole life and uh, actually increases with age as well. So we are so fortunate today to have um, four incredible women to come speak and tell us their stories. So Kanika, um, if you want to start with your story and just tell us you know, how everything happened and, and where you are today. Okay, sorry about that. I thought I was still on mute. 
Yes, um, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here to share my story. Um, so for me, mine started when I was 36 years old um, in 2010. I'd actually had a lot of issues with heavy nudities at that time. And um, for me, being on birth control wasn't new, but it was something that I had taken a break from prior to you know, the, the blood clots, I really was like, well, I don't really need them. You know, I'll just deal with this pain. And then finally I said, you know, I'll just try these, these birth control pills for a little bit to control the pain. And after about three months on, on the pill pack, I, I complained a little bit more about um, spotting in between the, the cycle. And I ended up switching the pills. And one week into switching the pills, I noticed that I had really, really um, rapid heart rate. Just going up a flight of steps left me incredibly winded. And for me at that time, we were actually planning, We were, our house was on the market. We were trying to sell, move, have another house built. And so I just thought, you know, I'm busy. I'm a young mom. I have two girls at the time. My girls were five and three years old. And um, there were times that I would just, I would get to work and I would sit in the parking lot and literally sleep after dropping my daughter off at daycare. I would sit there and I would sleep right before I needed to go into work just because I was so exhausted. But um, the day, the day before I actually went to the hospital, um, I, I thought that I had really bad gas and I walked around Target for a little while trying to get rid of it and um, nothing helped. And that night I could not lay down flat. And I woke up in the middle of the night, told my husband, I think something's wrong. And he said, well, you want me to call the ambulance? And I'm like, no, we're not going to wake up the neighborhood. No, we're not going to do that. So I waited till the morning. Um, at that time, I called my mom and I knew I, something just told me you can't drive like this. I don't, I couldn't breathe. It hurt to take a breath. The smallest breath hurt. It felt like someone was stabbing me. So I went to the hospital. Um, actually it was more of an urgent care center. And, um, but luckily they had access to um, radiology right next door. And after working me up, they found that I had extensive blood clots in both of my lower, lo lower lobes of my lungs. Um, and extending into like the segmental vessels, the smaller vessels, as well as um, clots in my right upper lobe. So um, I was sent to the hospital five days. I spent time there on heparin, and then I got out the hospital and did, you know, had the full workup by hematologists, and they found no reason for the clot. So they basically said it was birth control. And um, and yeah, so that was the first time. But unfortunately, this past December, I had another one um, after surgery. So yeah. I'm back on blood thinners again. Um, that time it wasn't as bad, but you know, I, I am still in the recovery phase of, of that last episode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Kanika, thank you so much for sharing that story and your story of having symptoms and, and blaming the symptoms on something else is so common, right? I mean, you thought you were moving, you thought you were short of breath, you had the rapid heart rate. I'm just wondering, you know, for, for you, let's just take a step back for the birth control. When you actually went on the birth control, you said you were on it, then you were off it, then you were on again. Did you ever have a conversation with your providers about potential risks of blood clots? Is it even something you were, was that a conversation you had with your provider before you went on them? Uh, no, and it's it's kind of funny. So because I am a pharmacist, I know a lot of the risks. I already, <laughs> I already knew the risks. Um, a matter of fact, the birth control that I was actually taking was a new one that was out on the market. Mm -hmm. And I knew with this particular one that the risk of clotting would be higher. And I'll never forget, I told my partner that I was working with at that time in the pharmacy, I said, all right, I'm going to try this. Now, if I get a blood clot, you know, we're going to know. And, and we both joked about it and stuff. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, mm -hmm. and um, lo and behold, it happened to me. Um, yeah. So let me ask you, I mean, you had this knowledge. You even knew that the one you were oh, on. Yeah. I even clinic. worked in a, I even worked in a Coumadin <laughs> clinic. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> So when you were having that high heart rate and that shortness of breath, did it ever cross your mind that you were having a blood clot? 
No, no, it really, I mean, it, I, I didn't, I didn't think, I thought I was 36. I was like, I'm, oh, I, I really didn't think that. I didn't, I didn't really think that maybe until like right up until I knew I could not breathe at all, but mm -hmm. I, I wasn't coughing up blood, but I had all mm -hmm. of the other Sign. Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. this last time in December, my heart rate was high all the time. I was a little more keenly aware. Yeah. And that was, that's my symptom is that yeah. really fast heart rate. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, what advice would you give to other women? I mean, here you are in the medical field, <laughs> right? And still, what advice would you give to people who, who might be in your position or who are thinking about maybe starting oral contraceptives or mm -hmm. having the symptoms that you're having? What would you, what would you give? What advice? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I mean, I, I think the advice I would give mostly is to advocate yourself, um, advocate for yourself rather, um, because nobody else is, is going to do it. And sometimes we just have to take a step back and, and, and just slow down. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really the best advice. I mean, there, there are several other things I, I could probably say, like no yeah. family history. Um, for me, now that my girls are older, they are of age where, you know, if they chose to take contraception um, pills, then, you know, that would be a risk. And knowing my risk, my daughter just had surgery. That's another risk. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. family history is incredibly important. And mm -hmm. I'm doing that teaching yeah. them very early now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that being an advocate and just knowing the symptoms. I mean, now, you know, heart rate, shortness of breath, something like that. I also want to ask you, you know, there's been recent studies that show blood clots um, occurs differently by race with blacks having highest, highest rates followed by whites yep. and then Hispanics and Asians. Overall incidence of blood clots is up to 60% higher in black individuals than whites and black patients have a higher rate of 30 day mortality. Mm -hmm. um, and we do know that actually there was a recent study that said um, racial disparities in the US are even more pronounced in younger adults. And we don't really know all the underlying causes for these disparities. Uh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that and, 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 and how you feel about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's really unfortunate. I think it really hit home for me too, as I was um, in the office with my hematologist after this last episode I had, and I specifically before the appointment, I had already, you know, done some research and looked up to see what was new since my last blood clot in 2010. And I asked her, I said, well, is there any, are there any new genetic mutations or variants that have been identified specifically in African-Americans um, since 2010? And she, she said, well, no, not really. There are a few things, um, but it just, it didn't pan out. And so I think, you know, my, my thoughts are, is we don't have enough research. And, um, you know, I am in, obviously in a field where it's driven by data and science Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think the education piece around um, clinical trials is important and also making sure that those um, disparities are actually addressed in enrolling patients in clinical trials. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I could not agree with you more about that. I'm so glad you said that. And I, I think you're right. We need to do so much more research in this area to really try to identify what these underlying risks mm -hmm. are, because we don't know, is it something, you know, uh, genetic risk? Is it the pathophysiology? Is it mm -hmm. something else, you know, inherent or, or related to environmental factors, patient related factors? We just don't know. And we, we do desperately need to have more research around this area because I think you're exactly right. The numbers um, are, are stark and, um, and quite significant. So we're not doing a very good job. Um, several approaches I think that you could take with that. I mean, that's, but I think that that's one huge area. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you shared that. Yeah. And I just, um, I want to just go back to birth control a little bit, because we talked about kind of the stages in a woman's life, you know, birth control, obviously, and, you know, birth control, some, you know, lots of different reasons we were on birth control to control menses, contraception, premenopausal syndrome, uh, menstrual syndrome, sy syndromes, things like that. And, um, you know, most, most horm hormonal therapies can manage men menstrual breathing and that's a huge benefit, but there is this risk. And I think what you brought up about your girls, you know, whether or not you had an inherited risk factor or not, your girls are still at risk, right? Because you've had a blood clot. And so I often will tell uh, my patients, you know, if they, if they have um, first degree relatives, that even if there is something that they've discovered that's inherited, because we've only, there's only five inherited risk factors that we actually know. And that's right. There are many more that are out there, but family history, 
um, is even more significant that, than that. Um, and so I think it's really important to talk to your providers and also just thinking about other risks, you know, on top of just the oral contraceptives. If, you're, if you are thinking about going on oral contraceptives, you know, your weight, smoking, inflammatory bowel disease, HIV, lupus, things, other inflammatory conditions, things like that really need to be addressed mm -hmm. um, by providers. And then somebody earlier asked, you know, what, why does estrogen increase your risk? And, and the reason it increases your risk is because it increases the proteins um, in your body that actually um, clot the blood. And it mimics pregnancy because during pregnancy, estrogen increases these clotting factors to prevent bleeding. There are progestins, um, which are um, carry a significantly lower risk of clotting when compared to estrogen. And so oftentimes we can prescribe those for people that have had blood clots. Um, um, and then there's non-hormonal options, things like spermicides, IDs, the progestin only pills, um, things like that. So I just, again, I think I wanna thank you for sharing your story. I think there were so many important take home points about this, know your risks, be an advocate, and that we need so much more research into the racial disparities. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to Katie, um, who I actually met a, a while ago, a number of years ago, and heard your story. And, and I just, um, if you don't mind sharing your story um, and telling us how, how you got here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, as everyone, I am so uh, thankful to be here and pumped to see all these people spend their Tuesday night with us. So thank you, everyone, for popping on and being so interactive in the chat, too. We're hoping to answer your questions. Um, but yeah, I had my first and only uh, PE in 2014. And I was down in Miami, training in the sun, uh, making a comeback for the 2016 Olympics in Rio. Um, and everything was going amazing. Actually, I was swimming the best side swum. Um, and leading up to the national championships was was a really important meet leading into the world championships, which is kind of the big show prior to the Olympics, um, I flew, uh, I, was, I was getting prepared to fly from Miami to California for the meet. Um, and about two weeks out, um, now looking back, I remember feeling kind of some soreness in my calf. Uh, but as an athlete, you know, I'm trained to ignore pretty much any ache and pain and soreness was a daily occurrence. And so I blew it off, whatever, it's fine. Um, and kept on my way. So I flew about five hours from Miami to, to California. And when we landed, I remember feeling this kind of weirdness, tightness in my chest. And at the time I immediately thought, uh, yeah, okay. It's probably a cold or something, whatever. I've got three days to a competition who hasn't had a cold, who hasn't worked through a cold, who hasn't competed through a cold. And I remember hopping in for warm up, and, you know, Everyone knows Michael Phelps for going 15 meters off the wall, right? Um, I could do that too. And so I was practicing that. And I remember barely getting past the flag, which was only five meters, so about a third of the way. I remember thinking, that's super weird, like super shortness of breath. Um, couldn't do, you know, a normal, my normal thing. And again, pushed it off. Um, just very, very similar stories. Uh, and continued prepping. And the next morning, that little weirdness in my chest then transformed into a pain in my rib area. And it wasn't a stabbing pain yet, but it was just kind of like an ache. And I remember again, mm -hmm. thinking like, did I pull a muscle? Like I'm resting now. I'm not doing anything super hard because I'm getting ready to swim in this competition and ignored it again. I wake up the morning of day one of competition and it's now that stabbing pain um, that, that everyone talks about, uh, not favorably, but I remember just thinking, okay, well, I don't know what this is. I popped some Advil. Again, my number one priority is competing and swimming fast. Like that is my profession. That's my job. Like I'm just trained to push past and ignore all pain, all symptoms. And so I swam my first race, which was more of like a warm up race. And I, I took it out great and I died miserably. And at that point, the pain was like now, like someone was stabbing me with a sword and I was in extreme pain, still ignored it, uh, went to dinner. And I remember that night, and I wonder if there's Rachel, like maybe, you know, but there's something about the evening because, uh, I think us mentioned it in the, at night too, but, um, that night, the pain and the stabbing became so great. And I felt like almost like a spasm that I couldn't even take in air and I ended up passing out wow. face first onto the bed, which was 
pretty crazy. Um, and my husband was left with, or my, my then fiance was left with, do we call the ambulance? Do we take her to the hospital? What do we do? And crazy enough, just to give everyone an idea of where my mindset was at that point, if you go into the, to a hospital without an exemption um, and you get an IV, you are instantly oh. dead. And wow. so at that point, once again, competing at nationals, making world championships. And my husband, who was also an elite athlete, got that. And so we ended up not calling anybody um, and went through the next five days of getting diagnosed. They were like, oh, it's just probably an intercostal strain. So I was, you know, getting massage. I was going in a hot tub, which I now know was probably one of the worst things I could do. Um, and ultimately ended up having, it's a five day meet. And I had, I, I couldn't, I could barely get down 50 meters. Mm. And I'm used to doing like miles in the pool. Mm. Uh, and I ended up, which is terrifying now, flying from Miami to Cal, flying from California to Miami, five hours wow. with these, I now know blood clots in my yeah. lung. Oh my goodness. Uh, luckily lived, uh, and then went through now the next seven weeks of misdiagnosis after misdiagnosis. They thought it was, uh, they thought it was pneumonia at first. I'm like, oh, it's not a strain. Perfect. They gave mm -hmm. me a Z pack. I was like, I'll be back in the water in like mm -hmm. three or four days. Mm -hmm. Still painful. Still, still, um, just can barely sleep at night. Um, and then they, I got to the point where it was like, it was pneumonia. It was asthma. I thought it was like a dislodged kind of rib. And so I was going to this alternative medicine person who was having me hit myself in the head. Like I was, I started n now slipping into depression because at this point I'm like, okay, I'm an Olympic athlete. Mm -hmm. I thought I was really tough. Like they're telling me I have asthma. I can't push past asthma. Um, mm -hmm all the while trying to still compete because again, like swimming was my, I mean, I, I was a sponsored athlete. Like swimming was my job. It wasn't a hobby. It wasn't just mm -hmm. something I liked to do on the side. Like it was, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and every single doctor that came into me time after time after time, um, would look at me and go, wow, you look young and healthy. I was like, well, what is, what does young and healthy look like? Like it, you haven't even looked at my yeah. chart. And so I increasingly got more and more and more frustrated, more and more doubting myself, um, you know, certainly yeah, yeah. didn't understand. And finally I was, I fed up and I just barged into my primary care doctor and I was like, just, can you just take my blood and test it? Like do something, mm. there has to be something there. Yeah. And, yeah. um, he, so he did a blood test, my D-dimer then, which I didn't even know what that was at the time, but my D-dimer was elevated, indicate, indicating there could be blood clots. Even then he was like, we'll mm -hmm. send over mm -hmm. to the hospital, mm -hmm. but like, it's probably nothing. Yeah, yeah. Go in and I never he came out and he looked at me and was like, well, you actually have blood clots. Oh You're my goodness, Katie, wow. <laughs> Finally, a diagnosis. And like at that moment, it was like relief, right? It wasn't even like, I didn't even, I still, I had never heard of a pulmonary embolism, mm -hmm. and blood clots. So I was just like, okay, well, does that mean you can fix me now? Like, do I get fixed now? Cause now I'm thinking I'm not mm -hmm. crazy. Um, mm -hmm. And so of course we had the conversation of a blood thinner. I'm so focused, fixated on, it hey, was that affect my endurance in the pool. Like I'm still not comprehending hundred thousand mm -hmm. people die from this mm -hmm. a year. I'm still not. Um, and then, I mean, I, I went on the blood thinners. I, you know, spent a couple of days in the hospital. Um, but I think that, and, you know, they basically said like, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing that I am probably the most passionate about talking about because it was like, okay, you're on the blood thinners. You go through your tests. I too was unprovoked. I have, I don't have factor five. It's not my family. I wasn't mm -hmm. on birth control. Like nothing was there mm -hmm. other than maybe being dehydrated a lot because I yeah, trained. Yeah, yeah. And so it wasn't okay after that. Like I still had, I had scar tissue build up. I still wasn't racing my best. Um, and so I, again, went to that place of like, well, what's wrong with me? Like mm -hmm. everyone else bounces back. Everyone else is just okay. And I didn't have, you know, the National Blood Clot Alliance mm -hmm. in the way we have our community and what we're building right now. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it, it was really, really difficult. And, um, I ultimately had to retire, um, oh, because yeah. when your lung capacity is just decreased by a few percent and hundreds mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. break first and last, yeah. um, 
that that's the difference. So um, it was, it's, you know, to this day, still, I have moments yeah. where I'm pushing on the Peloton and I push a little too hard. And I have that feeling of breathlessness that I felt. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I like start, I'll just break down crying. Like my husband <sighs> will come yeah. room and be like, what are you doing? Like, cause I'll keep going. He's like, yeah, stop, stop. It's okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think that's something that we don't talk about enough of the aftermath. Like mm-hmm. doctors are mm-hmm. great, check the box. You're all set. You're mm-hmm. alive, mm-hmm. but like alive versus I like to say thrive, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, um, yeah. It's well, so- Kay, thank you so much for sharing that an unbelievable story. And again, there are so many, first of all, the parallels of having these symptoms and thinking it's something else and just your drive, my God, of being better. And I, and I think, you know, the, I'm so glad you brought up the mental issue because we know that probably one in five patients with VTE will experience some kind of mental health issue, uh, anti, you know, depression, anxiety within the first few years after diagnosis. And, and it's really something that we don't appreciate, understand. And I, I think what you said, the main focus of care for patients that show up at the blood clot is, oh my God, let's keep you alive. <laughs> Let's make sure you don't die. Let's make sure you don't bleed to death. And those are very important outcomes, but they don't really capture what you brought up, which is these patient relevant outcomes like anxiety and depression and quality of life and functional abilities. Like, God, you're an athlete. You should be able to be on the Peloton and not worry about that. And I think, you know, decreased quality of life and functional limitations are so prevalent after blood clots. In, in fact, up to about 50%. And, and they can happen even with people on a blood thinner. They can be mild. They can be severe. And it's really kind of depression, anxiety, PTSD, unemployment, social isolation, even healthcare costs. And we know that for example, there was one study which showed that um, after the first episode of the blood clot, and that was associated with a 52% increased risk of work-related disability with 38% of people not returning to work within the first year. So it really is, you know, uh, really I- incredible. And, and I think, you know, the anxiety, there was actually a question earlier, like, how do you manage this post-clot anxiety? And for you, especially like just listening to your story, like you're a competitor, you've been a competitor since you were young, like you're an athlete, your body, your mind, like you're totally in control. You know, your competitor, you know, everybody, the lanes next to you, like this seems so out of control. Like talk to me about that aspect of it. Okay, good. I muted myself, but I realized I couldn't unmute. (laughs) Um, That was anxiety written just then. Uh, No, I, I think, I think um, that, that you hit it on the head right there. It's for the longest time, a lot of my training, what I was doing, like I knew what I could put out. I knew what I could do. And for one of the first times it was like, oh, like I can't mentally just push past this. I, I, I really cannot. And, um, you know, I, I think it was, it was really relying on, on the people around me, um, to help reinforce and, and give that empathy, um, which was, you know, my coach, uh, my mom and dad, my husband, you know, the people that you trust the most that, can, can say to you, like, there's going to be a lot of irrational thoughts, right? Like there's so many times, even though I knew, okay, like I can't control this. This is physical. This isn't me being weak in any way, shape or form. Um, I knew that, but I, I would still slip into moments of like, oh no, like what, what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. Why can't I push Mm -hmm. past this? I am weak. I was terrible. (sighs) I was breaking down and I needed those people around me to be like, Hey, listen, like, and, and kind of shake me sometimes. Like you cannot do it alone. You have to find those people that have been through it, um, or saw you go through it enough that they're going to be able to provide you that support and maybe just sometimes a listening ear, right? Like I Mm -hmm. think sometimes it's, it is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It could take a year. It could take two years. So being able to just have someone to just sometimes vent to, like, I know that that's not solving the mm-hmm. issue, but, um, sometimes just not feeling like you're going through it alone <laughs> makes the world of yeah. difference of being able to take a deep breath and go, okay, today's a tough day, but tomorrow's a new day. I'm going to get mm-hmm. back up and mm-hmm. keep fighting. I think it goes a, a longer way than most people give mm-hmm. credit. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad you said that. And, and I think you're right. Recognizing that you are not alone and you're not crazy. <laughs> it's so common and it can affect all aspects of your life, which you just mentioned. And I, um, I tell the story, I had a patient who passed out similar to you and woke up in an ambulance. And every time she heard an ambulance, she had a panic attack and ended up back in the emergency room and had like seven CAT scans. 
finally she came to see me and I set her up with a therapist who did some cognitive behavioral therapy. She can now hear an ambulance and not freak out. So I think exactly what you're saying, you got to get support, talk with your providers, talk with your family, talk with your friends. Don't try to do this yourself. And maybe talk therapy is good. Maybe cognitive behavioral therapy. Maybe if it's so debilitating, you need some medication. So I would say to people, do not stop until you get the help you need. And I will also just put a plug, you know, um, at the National Public Health Alliance, we, we really wanted to learn from this. And we launched something called the CLUE study, which was a critical look at the emotional suffering and blood clot survivors. And I just want to first thank anybody on this call that took that survey. It really is incredible. And we're gonna learn so much from you about how to better you know, better deal with these issues because they are so significant. We're in the process of analyzing that data right now, but we just want people to know that you're not alone exactly what you were just saying. And that the majority of people do have some kind of anxiety, depression, functional stuff. And, um, and we really need to learn from you and we really need to make sure people get support. So thank you really, Katie, for sharing that really. Really Rachel, um, yeah. question for you. As you're treating patients now, have you started to incorporate um, mental wellness as part of your overall treatment protocol for people? Well, you know me, so <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> but I, I think a lot of people don't know the questions to ask. And then even if they get the, the answer like, yes, I'm not feeling well, or I'm depressed or I'm anxious, they don't know what to do with that information. So I think we, we need to actually teach providers. And that's what our study is going to do, exactly that. We're going to be able to show that this is such a significant problem and we cannot ignore it. We really have to start incorporating it. It has to be part of uh, caring for patients, you know, right at the time. And I think it changes over time. I and mean, you can share your story, Leslie, that, you know, right when you get the diagnosis, you're so overwhelmed. And then the month later and then six months later, and, and Katie, here you are, you know, several years later, and you're still having, you know, these episodes. So it, it is, it can be, you know, really um, um, devastating and it can and last, um, you know, and not go away. And I, I think it's important that we learn about it and learn how to help people and how to help our patients. So absolutely it needs to be included. And I think if you're a patient on this and you are experiencing, you had a blood clot and you're having some anxiety, depression and just keep talking, find somebody who's going to listen to you. <laughs> Don't give up, be your, be your advocate uh, because what you're experiencing is real and you're not crazy. Yeah. I just want to tell everybody who's on the call tonight that this is uh, one of our top priorities at uh, NBCA. And uh, just like we have on our website uh, resources to find a doctor to help you, we are going to be doing something similar around how to find a mental health professional to help you as well. So that'll be one of the things that we roll out in the next several months. So be on the lookout. We know it's real. We know everybody suffers from it. Um, we understand it because we're patients too, and we will have resources hopefully soon for everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you again, Katie. Um, so Heidi, uh, would love to uh, hear your uh, story about um, how, I know, I know you've told me before, your, your, your several blood clots, which is so frightening, but uh, uh, please share, us, uh, share with us your story. Thank you, thank you so much, Rachel. And I also just wanna say thank you to Leslie for inviting me here to tell my story. Admittedly, I've actually never told my full story. Um, I'm a lobbyist by day and I advocate on a lot of different issues for a lot of different things. But tonight is the first time that I'm advocating for myself truly. And I really hope that my story helps those that have encountered some um, crappy situations when, as you know, others have said, and, and thank you to the other um, brilliant ladies, lesson learned, don't follow a famous Olympic swimmer. Um, <laughs> My life is so boring, after that. <laughs> but, um, but but truly, you know, we we have so many similarities and and, and so many differences. And um, I got my first clot in 1992 at the age of 19, and it was due to oral contraceptives. I didn't know that at the time. No one had really talked to me about it or or offered up any sort of risks. Um, but you know, I thought I was doing the responsible thing. Um, so. After about a month, my leg was very swollen, purple. I went to the emergency room. I sat there for about 10 hours in agonizing pain. And it wasn't until happenstance that I was diagnosed by a physician actually walking by. He had popped in. I caught his eye because I was so young. I was 19 and my room was filled with all my fellow college dorm mates trying to cheer me up because, you know, I was in so much pain and he was telling us to quiet down. And he looked at my leg and he was like, gosh, you know, you have a blood clot. 
that's that's interesting how old are you and that's what started my treatment not the best way to start a treatment when you enter into an emergency room but it sounded simple enough i was hospitalized for seven days um, as i was moved from heparin to coumadin i was like great seven days no classes i was pretty excited um, on day four, I really did start having a hard time breathing. Um, it was very labored. I felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest. So without any notice or explanation from any doctor or nurse, I was shuttled to the ICU. And they just told me that they had wanted to just watch me more closely. I was just getting special attention. I was special, they kept telling me. But at the time, I was battling a very serious pulmonary embolism for weeks and not realizing at the time how close I was to death. So that was very scary. I mean, I left the hospital 19, behind on college classes, no more information than when I was admitted. I was just told to stay on Coumadin for six months and wear a very sexy compression stocking, <laughs> which as you can imagine, hitting the bar <laughs> at 19, you know, guys were all over me. <laughs> um, but I thought that would be it. Um, I, I never did get back onto oral contraceptives. I took my medicine diligently. I didn't like Coumadin. It was a lot of Coumadin clinic time. Um, but every time I walked in, doctors were like, you're so young. Oh my gosh, how does this keep happening to you? I eventually got diagnosed with factor five Leiden, come from a long line of clotters. Our blood is like maple syrup. I mean, I was telling the ladies earlier, if you cut me, I do not bleed. <laughs> so when I got pregnant at 40, it was really a shock. Um, I was in the emergency room again. I knew uh, immediately the signs of a blood clot. I told my husband, I'm taking a shower. We're going to the ER. Um, my leg is really hurting and swollen again. And the doctor just comes in beaming with like happiness. And I thought to myself, I was like, God, what a weirdo who gets this excited about blood clots. She's like, did you hear the news? Did you hear the news? I was like, yeah, I, I figured as much. But she blurted out, congrats, you're pregnant. And my husband and I were in total shock. So of course, you know, that was not the, the best situation for someone in, you know, who had the history that I did, but I did all the right things. I got my hematologist. I had a high risk OBGYN. They were both at the same hospital here in Washington, DC at Georgetown. They had a plan, I had a plan. So the plan was to induce the Sunday before Thanksgiving, which was my due date. So there would be no shortage of uh, shortage of staff. Everything was going to be fine. But what happened was like after 36 hours, there was still no baby. I was in very heavy, painful labor. Um, I was at a premier hospital. I had put all my trust into these doctors, even though I should have probably known better given my history. But the attending refused to give me a C-section. So I was exhausted. I was delirious. I kept hearing nurses whispering. They were very concerned how I would even have the strength to push to have this baby. My husband, no offense to all the men out there, he was sort of at a loss. He didn't know how to help. We were really struggling. So luckily my brother, who is a surgeon, he called to congratulate us, the new parents. And he was shocked to hear that the baby was still not here. And he was like, what is going on? So it was really him. He demanded to talk with the attending physician. And I recall hearing him shouting at her, to read my chart. And, you know, he kept saying over and over again, no, she will not bleed to death. She will not bleed to death. You're not looking at what she has. So after, you know, several minutes of this back and forth, I was finally taken in and my son was born. The C-section went fine. The doctor apologized. She said if she had known, she would have done the C-section 24 hours sooner, mm. which I would have preferred because I really wanted my son to be born on the 24th, not the 25th. But <laughs> But that was no consolation. And not everyone has a brother. And the only reason that my brother as a doctor could even step in because he was there and he watched me battle my first PE. It's actually why he became a doctor. So he knew my complete history. So I, I think the struggle here and why I'm so passionate about NBCA and so excited to be part of this team is the ad, you know, advocating the communication. My husband didn't know how to tell my story. I was too exhausted to tell my story. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that more doctors and more patients become more vocal about this because they just couldn't believe that, you know, I mm -hmm. would be fine and I was totally fine. Mm -hmm. So that's my story. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think, you know, what you highlighted is really having a team, right? Like you got pregnant, 
you got a high risk OB, you had a multidisciplinary team. It seems like there was some communication issues at the end there, but um, but really, like you you know you did everything that you should, and um, and there's still some issues. So it sounds so challenging, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges, um, especially around um, around these you know issues where people get so you know nervous. And and I think you know we know that pregnancy is one of those risk factors, right? So we went through kind of women's uh, you know life, you know OCPs, oral contraceptives, now pregnancy and. We know that PE can cause about 20% of maternal deaths in the United States and pregnant women have at least five times a higher risk. And the risk mm -hmm. is highest actually the first week after the, after the baby is born, um, mostly because you've just, you know, revved up your clotting system to, to deal with the bleeding. So um, I think it's, it's so important that you got kind of everybody on board with that. And, you know, pregnancy, again, you know, you're hypercoagulable, meaning you're, you've revved up those clotting systems, but then also like you have this big baby pressing on your veins. And so that can increase your risk. And then you might have some other risks. Like for you, you had prior history of a blood clot. Mm -hmm. So you were already at a higher risk. Um, so I think, um, you know, just, just so important. And, and one, one question we had um, in the chat was, you know, about C-section and did they talk to you about risks of, of blood clots with the C-section? Did you have, or did they talk to you about before that or, or that not was something you knew about? Not no. at all, Rachel. I mean, the way it was described to me, like this birth, which was my first and my only, it was going to be dreamy. I came in Sunday night, I got my Pitocin by Monday, everything was going to be rocking and rolling. So C-section was never actually even on, on the table. So um, I, I really do wish that I had pushed a little bit harder to obtain some information around that. And I, and I just didn't. Yeah. So we know that C-section is, is, you know, carries a very high risk. There was, um, I know this is not a scientific thing, but there was a view of about 180 patients had blood clots that occurred during pregnancy and the risk of it, 60% um, of them were after um, pregnancy. And in fact, C-section was the highest risk factor, about 40% of them, it was with C-section higher. If you have the thrombophilia, like you, the mm -hmm. factor five Leiden. So um, I think, you know, uh, C-section, why does it increase your risk of clotting? Because it's a surgery and any surgery can increase the risk of, of clotting. Um, and um, women actually that had emergency C-sections were four times more likely to develop blood clots um, than women who, who delivered vaginally. So, and then on top of that, if you have other risk factors, you know, older age, uh, obesity, things like that, infections, and for you, like I said, prior, prior blood clots. I'm wondering, you know, because you knew that you had the factor five lot and, and had anyone talked to you about, you know, what to do uh, in terms of like preventing pregnancy? And is that something, you know, I know you couldn't go back on all contraceptives. Did they talk to you about alternatives to the estrogen that you had been on? Yeah, Rachel, you know, that is very interesting because I do uh, talk to my OBGYN often and, and some say, you know, progesterone is the way to go. Some have encouraged me to get the implantable um, device, not the, you know, um, one that like leaks the drugs, but, you know, um, but I, I've never heard from more than a couple of doctors a, a consistent solution. So mm -hmm. I've always been very hesitant to, to do that because I, I, I never heard from like three doctors, like, yes, this is what mm -hmm. you should do. This is going to mm -hmm. be helpful. So mm -hmm. I've always just felt that, you know, uh, my husband has his surgery done and, and we just are taking additional precautions, but mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's about what we decided to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I and mean, we do know that, you know, estrogen is probably the biggest risk factor. There's different types of estrogen, um, kind of the, the, um, uh, ones that are synthetic estrogens. And uh, can you, I think you probably were on that one because that does have the increased mm -hmm. risk of blood clots. And then uh, there's the non-synthetic ones, um, which we generally find in the hormone replacement. Um, but overall risk of estrogen containing products uh, increases one's risk about twofold uh, higher baseline than the general population. If you add things like factor five light in, or you're a smoker or you're obese, or you have underlying inflammatory condition, or you have HIV or you have lupus, that's going to further increase your risk. And there's lots of questions about, okay, what is safe? Now you, you know, you had, um, you know, you chose to have your husband um, uh, uh, take that. Um, if I had to go through the section, he could <laughs> do this part. But there are, you know, there are, so the progestin ones do have significantly less risk, except for the Depo-Provera one that does have an increased risk. So the pills um, or the implantable ones, and oftentimes those are the ones that I will, um, talk with my patients about going on. And if you're on 
an anticoagulant already, then, um, uh, then that's protecting you too. Oftentimes uh, people can actually stay on their estrogens, especially if they have really significant bleeding, if they're on them. Oftentimes we don't start people on estrogen right after a blood clot, even if they're on um, an anticoagulant, those are the people that I would do progestin only. But for the most part, I think those are pretty safe. And it's really having that conversation with your provider about what other risks you have and you have to worry about those other risks. And I think this leads into, you know, Leslie, I know you weren't going to go into your whole story, but, you know, one of the issues um, with women who are on oral contraceptives to control their menses, then they get a blood clot, then they get taken off their estrogen. And then what? Because now they're on a, an anticoagulant, which is certainly going to increase risk of um, having even heavier menses. So I know, Leslie, you, you had that experience. Yeah. So um, what's interesting is I was on birth control for like 25 years and never had any issues with blood clots, never even really knew what a blood clot was. I mean, my OBGYN said, oh, you're getting older. We want to make sure that you know, we're going to take you off of birth control. There's a risk of um, you getting a blood clot as well as some other things. And so I was like, okay. And then I was perimenopausal and I had really heavy periods. And the day that I actually got my blood clot and I, you know, had very similar symptoms to some folks where, you know, very hard to breathe, thought I was having a heart attack, you know, pain, um, and ended up in the emergency room. And they were, and I'm in New York City, four years ago. Um, and they ended up doing actually three gynecological exams on me and told me that I had fibroids and that's why I was having a hard time breathing. Um, and so they were going to release me from the hospital. And thankfully they decided to check my lungs before they, they, uh, did that. And of course I presented with bilateral pulmonary embolism. And the next thing I knew I was actually in the ICU. Um, mm. And when I, when I left, I think similar to Kanika, when I left the hospital, I left with nothing. You know, I got into an Uber with an Eloquist prescription and off I went. Um, and I had my period and I was on a really heavy duty blood thinner because I was newly diagnosed and it was just awful. And I couldn't reach my doctor. Um, I couldn't reach anybody. I didn't know what was normal. You know, it was, I was terrified of this happening or what was mm -hmm, happening to me. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it needs to be addressed. It's really important. And I wish somebody had told me what would be happening. You know, I ended up um, transitioning over to another hospital. And when they did blood tests on me, they were just, you know, mortified at um, my iron levels and how anemic I was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Because I think that that issue is so often ignored. You know, I'll have, I leave a, a clinic at my hospital where people come into the emergency room, they get put on a blood thinner. I usually see them within a few weeks and people are not sharing that information, exactly what you're saying. Oftentimes they're on the oral contraceptives because to control their bleeding. Now you're taking them off the oral contraceptives and you're putting them on a blood thinner. So it's just essential that we, that we share this information. So women know, and um, I usually say to people, you know, you're probably gonna have an increase in your menses, maybe 10%, but if it's significantly more, then we do want to think about underlying anatomical problems like fibroids. And there was a study that did show that if you do have significant bleeding, um, that you should make sure you don't have anything underlying. Um, and then I think there are a lot of options. I mean, generally not within the first three months, but Generally, you can go on, like I said, the progestin only. I'm a little bit hesitant to put people newly on estrogen, but oftentimes there's some data now that we might not necessarily need to stop the estrogen if people are on anticoagulants. Um, and then there are things when people, after they're kind of in the acute setting, maybe that first three months, oftentimes we'll talk about, you know, maybe you, you go down to a lower dose at your heaviest day of period, maybe you hold it that one day of the really heavy day. Um, there's also drugs that can um, kind of block the breakdown of clots, which can decrease ble bleeding. So it's really important, anyone on the, on the call here, that if you are somebody who's on anticoagulant and you're having significant bleeding, do not ignore that because you're end up like Leslie and the back end severely yeah. anemic and feeling like crap. So we actually have ways to treat that. And it's really important to share that with your physicians, because again, this is a huge learning opportunity, an opportunity we can do with providers to ask the question. Kind of very similar to the whole mental mental health issue, but this is really a topic that we we should we should absolutely not ignore. So thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, there are um, there are a lot of questions in the chat, and I, and I would just say you know there there's so much uh, support going on in, in this chat. People are uh, you know sharing their stories. There's some Facebook phases, and we put in a link to the National Blood Clot Alliance. We have a lot of resources um, at, at not at stop the plot. So certainly, um, please, 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 please go go there and take a look. 
I would like to um, kind of ask each of you, you know, just if you were to say kind of the most important thing you've learned about um, blood clots or sharing your story or advocacy or knowing your risks or, or anything, what is the most important thing you'd want to share with people who are in your similar situation? So can you, I'll start with you. Oh, goodness. Yeah, you can pick more than one if you want. One. If I can only... <laughs> okay, you can pick more than one. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think not ignoring your symptoms is probably key. Um, I, I listened to uh, Katie tell her story and I'm just like, oh my gosh. I mean, my mom wanted to kill me when I waited so long to <laughs> call her to tell her I didn't think I could drive to the hospital that day. Um, and then even most recently in December, I waited, you know, several days until I finally said, you know, something's not right. Um, so, you know, I'd say don't ignore your symptoms, go be seen, insist that they figure out what's going on. And I think that PTSD or, you know, post-traumatic stress after a clot is really real because most recently in December, after the second time I had PEs, the reason I did not want to go to the hospital was because, well, one, I had just gotten out of surgery, but two, it was, you know, COVID-19. And I said, mm. well, all of these people here are sicker than me. Why do I want to go to this hospital? Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, I don't want to waste their time. I know I'm going to get there. They're going to say, oh, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's nothing wrong with you. Like I was going through this, it, this in my head. So um, ig- ignore the noise and, and just, just do it. Just go be seen and, and take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. Mom's got to slow down. It's Mother's Day coming. You have to. <laughs> yeah. And thank you so much for sharing them. And each of you shared stories where you had symptoms and, you know, we do ignore them. And because, you know, you're an athlete, it's, you know, you pulled a muscle, you, you know, but so I think definitely, you know, everybody, you, we know our body's the best. And if there's something that is not making sense or feeling right, just do not ignore those symptoms because, you know, this, the, the, this can cause, this can cause death and not to scare people, but this is, you know, uh, a lethal uh, potential uh, problem that, that actually we can treat if we can diagnose it early and even better if we can prevent it. <laughs> so um, Katie, please share your, your closing thoughts. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm gonna echo everything that Kanika just said. I mean, I think for I think trust your gut is how I would say it. You know, I think um, just in society we're trained to like it, it's almost a badge of honor to tough through something or do something on off of not that many hours of sleep or like it's just it's become that way. And you know, I would I had a, a wise mentor once tell me like a woman's intuition is the most powerful. A smart thing ever, like always trust a woman's intuition. And so, you know, you, you know, you understand yourself, you can trust when you're feeling like something's off and we're all running around and doing a million things at once. Uh, and so sometimes I think it's even down to like, oh, I don't want to like take time to go to the doctor and I don't want to make that appointment. And it's like, when you actually think about it, what you just said, Rachel of, okay, well, it could be the difference between life or death. Like, you're going to take the couple, you know, the hour or two to go in and just confirm everything is okay or not. Um, but I wish I had done that. You know, maybe I would still be swimming if, if I had, you know, gone in really early and advocated more and, and, you know, done more research or whatever that might be. There's always those what it could have should is, but, um, you know, trust yourself because you're usually right. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Heidi, how about you? I would absolutely agree with the other two ladies about, you know, being an advocate, asking more questions. I certainly wish I was strong enough to ask questions at the age of 19 instead of just starting oral contraceptives because all my friends were on them, you know, um, but who knows, you know, if I hadn't and gotten, you know, pregnant and, you know, so what it could have, should have, but I, I would say that, you know, as, as women just actually having conversations about our menses and, you know, being on these medications and, you know, not having a resource to turn to. I, I see a lot in the chat. Of the, I think we're all going through a lot of the very similar things, but I've never talked to my own doctor about them. Um, so yes, absolutely. Trust yourself. You know yourself best. 
and find yourself a very good doctor like Rachel, who I wish <laughs> would train every other doctor on the planet. Because again, you know, sometimes I have to remind my own doctor of just things I can't take prescription wise. Cause I'm like, have you forgotten? I'm on Zarelto. I can't take that. So again, just don't be quiet, be loud. Mm -hmm. And Heidi, if you don't mind me asking, you said you don't share this with your doctor, all the things that we've just talked about. Why not? You know, I don't know. I just figure heavy periods, blood thinner seems to make sense. I, you know, like, I guess that's, I, I just feel like I'll just suffer in silence because, you know, I just suffer in silence and that's terrible. So, um, I, so I, I wish that I had talked more openly about it and not just taken that, well, you are on a blood thinner, you're going to have a heavier period as the answer. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it sounds like it's not. So mm -hmm. no one told me that, by the way. Like I was just like shocked. Yeah, me either. And like, that was the reason. Was happening. <laughs> yeah. I was dying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I, for me, it was crazy because I was on the pills for a few months to get rid of the heavy periods. And then they came back. It just all came back full circle. And so then what was I left with? No one was addressed, still addressing that part. And Kanika, what did you do? I don't remember what I did um, because I think I was more focused on trying to get back to working out and just, you know, getting my lung capacity back to where it was before and that kind of stuff. So I don't, I don't, I didn't do anything. Obviously I didn't go back on any birth control, but I think things just got controlled after a while, ended up actually having a uterine ablation some years later, Oh yeah. which, um, which did control things for a good while, but then it came back in full force. And I ended up with um, adenomyosis so um, that's why I, I had a hysterectomy recently, uh, which led to the second clot. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's all good now. But, but again, even after that surgery, here I am not focusing on the fact that I just had surgery, but focusing on the fact that I have to, you know, now go see cardiology and pulmonology and follow up on that. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it's also important to think about advocacy and pieces because like I did listen to my body. I had a hard time breathing. I went to the emergency room and they were completely fixated on something else. And, you know, in a way I was advocating because I didn't feel well, but the way that I was diagnosed initially was not the appropriate way. And so, you know, I think I learned to advocate as time went on, as I educated myself about blood clots. And so, yeah, listen to your body, go in, you know, go to the emergency room. But then I think as we come up that learning curve that we're forced to come up, then you can really start to advocate even harder for yourself. So for instance, I transitioned over to a different hospital. Um, I had a hematologist that everybody said was fantastic and I didn't feel as though he was responsive enough to me. I fired him and I went and got myself another hematologist. And so, you know, this is a team approach and you're the patient is the captain of the team. And make sure you surround yourself with people who really are supportive of your health journey because they play a huge role in it. And so just if you're not comfortable with the team that you have, get a new one. I know it's really hard, mm -hmm. but for me, it made a huge difference. And then, you know, the other issue is, you know, as Katie was talking before about the mental health, I felt like I was going through my checklist of what I needed to do physically for myself, but I had no idea how to handle the mental side of the equation. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I asked for referrals from doctors and I didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I finally ended up finding a therapist that I worked with um, who helped me tremendously, but I still suffer from it, you know, to this day, it's been four years. Mm -hmm. um, but really, you know, just try hard to find somebody that will treat you physically and try hard to find somebody that will treat you mentally as well. Mm -hmm. and, and Leslie, so, so thank you so much for sharing that. Like, don't stop with the first person that you're not getting yeah. your information. I mean, I think there was a question about how do you deal with anxiety if no one's listening to you, or how do you, how do you find care if you're not being cared for, or you're not being listened to? And I think you just, 
you, ha- you have to keep pushing through. And for, you know, for you, you fired the first person, you went to a different doctor, you then you know, pushed until you got the right mental health. And as much as we don't want to put all that on patients, if you're not getting what you need, you, you have to. And if you can't advocate for yourself, find somebody that's going to advocate for you because it's Absolutely. so important to, to get the well, care you need and to feel cared for. And it's also the difference between life and death. I mean, I'm an unprovoked patient, so they don't know why I got this. And the first you know, set of doctors that I went to told me that I would be on a blood thinner for six months and that I would transition off of it. And you know, the research actually shows that if you're unprovoked, you're probably gonna stay on it for a very long period of time or potentially mm-hmm. forever. And mm-hmm. that's what my second set of doctors said. So you really have to, you can't let your life be in somebody else's hands. Like we all have to do a little mm-hmm. bit of research mm-hmm. about what has happened. Um, Absolutely. I and do then, want to, oh, yeah. um, so, I know you have some great yep, slides yep, 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 to yep. show everybody. And, show then we have, and then we have a bunch of questions that we'd okay, like to try perfect. to get through as well. Yes, perfect. But just two other things about the, the bleeding, um, just to, to let people know that, again, it is common if it is, you know, significant and causing really, you know, iron deficiency anemia where you're fatigued and have to be iron infusions, you have to do something about it. Maybe it's switching anticoagulants. Uh, maybe it's, you know, again, making sure there's not something anatomical. There are medications you can do. You can talk to your doctor about progestin only. You can even talk about starting estrogen, depending on when your blood clot was. You can talk about going down to a lower dose, um, sometimes even holding it, although that can be risky if you've had, you know, significant clots, you're a high risk. But just you need to, to again, find somebody to really sit down and talk with you about these because you should not be suffering. And then I just want to clarify with the C-section, because I I think I (laughs) might've scared people, your risk of having a blood clot after C-section is not 40%, but in this study of that 180 patients, um, 40% of them, actually 47% of them that had a blood clot, it was due to a C-section. And then obesity was the second one. And then family history was actually about 20%. So those were the risks. It just, it doesn't mean if you've had a C-section, you have a 40% risk of getting a blood clot. I didn't want to make sure people didn't get that. So oftentimes um, when people have blood clots, um, I, I ask them if they want to see what they look like. And um, oftentimes people has, have never seen what their blood clot looks like. And so the way I describe it is like, your lungs are kind of like a tree, right? You've got, you got a tree trunk and then you've got a right and left side and then all these little branches. And so there's something called a saddle pulmonary embolism. That is a blood clot right in the tree trunk. It's in the vessels that lead off to the right and left. Because again, you think of your, your lungs as like a, a tree. And you can think of, you know, if you were to cut the, the, the nutrient, if you were to you know, cut the supply of nutrients and water um, right at the trunk of a tree, the tree wouldn't do very well. <laughs> if you were to do it partially, then you could still get some nutrients up there. And that's what blood, blood clots can do. And so a saddle PE is one that's right in the middle um, between the right and the left, um, and is really, you know, one of the most concerning. And then you can have big ones in the right and the left, and then you can get ones in littler branches. Um, and when people have a blood clot, they might have a blood clot in the little branches. And actually those are the ones that cause the most significant pain. When you take a deep breath and you have that significant pain, it's oftentimes ones in the periphery near the nerves. Um, but then when people like pass out, like Katie, those might indicate that you have a pretty significant blood clot that's really starting to injure your heart. And oftentimes when people get that, we do more than just blood thinner. Sometimes we go in and we suck the clot out. Sometimes people have surgery. Sometimes we infuse kind of a blood clotter right into the clot. So, you know, having a, a team, a multidisciplinary team to, to um, actually treat the blood clots is, is really important. So just to give you kind of a, a 101 on blood clots. So I'm gonna share my screen here if I can. And just again, um, so think of that tree um, that I mentioned. Let's see, share screen. Ah, here we go. All right, so let's just do this. So this is um, somebody that had blood clots on the right and left and I've showed the arrows. So again, think of that tree and this is the right and the left. So this is, if you're taking a, a, a slice of somebody from the head to the toe, this is their lungs and the black is air and those vessels um, are, are, and then they, they should be completely white because that means blood is coursing through them. But you can see these black areas and that's are actually the blood clots. They're, they're clogging up the vessels. And so when you see these blood clots um, after the blood clots, like this arrow right here, you don't see any more of the tree, right? Because it's actually cut off the blood supply there. And same here, you don't see any more of the tree. Um, here there's you know um, a blood clot here. Um, not here, but you can see these are pretty big. And then this is what I was talking about, that saddle PE. So this is a cross section. Imagine I'm taking a slice of you right here and I'm holding it up. This is a cross section. 
So again, you can see blood clots in the right and the left side. This is right because it's kind of reversed. And here's that saddle one. Here's that tree trunk area. There's that saddle one. And then sometimes we can see whether or not you're straining your heart. So you've got a right side of your heart and the left side of your heart and the ratio between the right and the left should be equal. But sometimes when the right is bigger than the left, it means you're really straining your heart. It means that that blood flow trying to get from the right to the left side is really strained by the blood clots in the lungs. And then um, I wanna share one more with you. And this was a woman that came into the hospital and she was short of breath and she got a CAT scan. And you can see here, she's got no blood clots. Here's her um, left um, um, main, what's called pulmonary emboli. And you can see um, these vessels here and on the right, you can see them. Um, and then as she was in the hospital about a week or so later, uh, she started to get short of breath and you can actually see here, she's got a, a blood clot here and that's that dark area. And I just wanna point out that here you can see all these vessels on this side. There's no, there's no more vessels, right? Because it's those vessels are being um, clogged up by the blood clot. Um, and then the last one I want to show you, and again, this is that section of where if I just go up to down. Um, and again, this was uh, before where you can see these vessels coming off here. And then here's the blood clot. And there's really, it's all black. There's no vessels there. And she had blood clot over here too. So oftentimes patients say to me, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll always offer to show patients their, their um, scans and some people do. Some people are like, oh my God, no, <laughs> that's gonna scare me. But just to get a sense of if you've had a blood clot, this is oftentimes what it'll look like. Now I've shown you central blood clots. These are in the center. But again, I'm gonna just go back to that you know, original one. Oops, let me go back. Um, and you, know, you can have blood clots in these little branches which generally don't uh, injure the heart or you can have blood clots in the ones that are more central which are more likely to injure, their, injure your heart. Um, and then just to, again, reiterate that, you know, these are kind of the cycles, and this is from the National Blood Clot Alliance, um, I believe uh, Taryn made this, it's absolutely beautiful, but really it's like women in blood clots kind of your risk through life and beginning of life. And I think it's really important that anybody can get a blood clot. You can be the most fit athlete in the world, <laughs> you know, Katie Hoff, like Olympic swimmer, she got a blood clot. Um, and you can be young, you can be old, it really doesn't matter. It can affect anybody, any age. Birth control, again, places people that estrogen increases the risk of clotting. Thinking about uh, family planning, if you're somebody that might need a little bit of help getting pregnant with IVF, that can increase pregnancy and childbirth and postpartum, huge risk factor. And then treating menopausal symptoms like uh, hormone replacement is another thing. Um, and then as we get older, um, our, our risk of getting blood clots, you know, your risk of getting a blood clot in your 20s is about one in 10,000 and your 80s is about one in 100. So as you go through time, it also increases. Um, so I did want to share those. I'll stop my screen. And then um, I think we have a number of questions or any, any comments. Have you guys all seen blood clots, your blood clots before? I think you guys had, right? So I actually haven't seen mine, um, but I've seen scans and I'm, I'm just curious, once somebody has been diagnosed with uh, a PE and we know that the body has to get rid of the PE by itself and the blood thinner that you're on is to prevent new one, correct? Yeah. So your own body is going to resorb the blood clot you have. And then the blood, the anticoagulant you're on is to prevent new blood clots or that blood clot from getting bigger. And oftentimes people say, well, how long is it going to take for them to completely go away? And will they all completely go away? And everybody's different. And we haven't been able to predict who's going to have blood clots that are going to completely resolve and who's going to have leftover. I, I can't remember one of you said that you were, you know, you can still have symptoms. There is kind of, you know, the post PE syndrome, not only anxiety, depression, pain that we talked about, but you can have chronic shortness of breath. And there's something called chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary disease. And what happens is the blood clots form little webs in those vessels. Um, and you can have shortness of breath because you just, even though the blood clots might not be there, you've injured the vessels to the point where you really can't um, uh, breathe uh, uh, as, as, as you'd like to. And so we have, if that were to happen, you definitely want to go um, and seek um, uh, an expert, um, you know, an expert about that. And do you, um, or is it patient dependent? Because we do get this question a lot. After six months or so, some people, it'll be recommended that they get another scan and others not. So when is that decision made? How is that decision made? Yeah, so that would be, I generally do not get another scan unless, unless it's gonna change my management. So what you're talking about is if you're worried about somebody having chronic you know, post-PE syndrome and potentially this you know, very severe form of um, post-PE syndrome, that's the time that they'll generally 
you know, do maybe an ultrasound of the heart. Maybe they'll do a scan of looking at the, you know, how much blood flow is going into those lungs. And then oftentimes they'll do a CAT scan to look for that. But I don't recommend getting a CAT scan just to follow up to see if they're gone because why are you exposing people to radiation and contrast when it's really not going to change your management? Whether or not there's still a little bit of blood clot there is not going to dictate how long you need to be on the blood thinner. It's okay. more, what was your risk of having the blood clot? Have you removed that risk? And have you removed all the other risks that you'd worry about? And that is going to dictate how long people need to be on it. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so we have a bunch of questions okay. and we're going to try to um, get to them. some of them. Some of them are actually in the um, chat. Yeah. So, um, sorry. Um, what are your thoughts about testing for blood clot risk before using oral contraception? Yeah, so um, we did talk a little bit about this, the, the, thr the inherited thrombophilia. So um, when people, so there's five known risk factors um, for blood clots and um, the risk of having a blood clot um, is higher in people that have an inherited thrombophilia. Um, but the, the percentages are, are so low that it's actually not, not what, what they call cost-effective to do that. What I would say is it's more important to talk about all of your risks. And family history, I think, is as equally important as doing any testing. So right now, the recommendation is not, you don't test people. However, any person that's thinking about going on all contraceptives, it is, it is essential that you go through with your provider and talk about, like, do you have a family history? I mean, I think, Heidi, right? Didn't you have your dad and your maternal grandmother die of a PE and somebody put you on a whole contraceptive, like that would be the first thing, you know, that, that, and Heidi, did anyone ask you about your history before putting you on birth control? No, and I did tell them that my dad had a blood clot. He had two um, from a sports injury. And, and again, this was the early nineties and they said, oh, there's no correlation. It's not genetic, which mm -hmm. we now know is, 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 is different, but still today, when I answer questionnaires, not many people ask, do, are there other blood clots in my family? Yeah. And, and we all, on my dad's side, that we all had them. Yeah, yeah. So really, again, really important. And, and I think the thrombophilia, you know, I'm, I'm not saying we never test people, but it's more important to kind of go through those risks. For example, you know, Kanika, you didn't have a family history and you ended up getting a blood clot with oral contraceptives, right? So um, I think equally important, again, and a, and a lot of times just to bring up the testing is, Many insurance companies are not actually covering for the test anymore because there's a big push not to test and really to just look at all the risks. But equally as important, Kanika, is for you um, and anybody else starting an oral contraceptive is to know the symptoms of a blood clot, right? And not to ignore them if you get them. Chest pain, chest pressure, shortness of breath, leg pain, leg swelling, things like that. Um, so as, 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 as important as it, as it is, um, do that. So, and really just working with your healthcare provider to assess your clotting risk and whether or not it's appropriate and safe for you to go on all contraceptives that contain estrogen. And if it's not, then you can do one of the alternatives. Yeah. I was just going to say, I saw someone had, had asked if um, I was on blood thinners before I had my surgery in December and I was not. Um, after my first episode in 2010, I did my course of Coumadin and they said, you're fine. You know, you're young, you're healthy, good. Just don't take hormones for the rest of your life. So I thought I was good. But even leading up to my surgery, I always brought up the fact that I had PEs in 2010. And they were like, oh, that was like 11 years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're fine. Mm -hmm. And it was provoked, right? It was provoked by birth control. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, then we don't usually do anything. And I was just like, mm okay. And yeah, but you know, during surgery, I did have like the compression and all of that. Mm -hmm. I, I did all of that, but I probably should have been on like Lovenox or something like that before the surgery. Yeah. yeah. So I think for, for you and Katie, both, like if you've had a blood clot and you're going to go and you and your provider kind of review the risks of, you know, should I stay on? Should I not? Typically, mm -hmm. Should you stay on? Yes, if you have ongoing risks. <laughs> yeah, well, for me, had... I'm definitely a life lifetimer now, for sure. Well, now, yes. Yeah. Um, but but then, if you are somebody that had a provoked blood clot, um, and you um, are you don't have any other risk factors, um, and you can go off the blood thinner, it's really important to know that in other high clotting risk situations, you need to go back on a blood thinner. So those would be things like surgery, hospitalization, got to break a leg, um, pregnancy, things like that. 
Um, those would be times that you'd you, you know want to talk to your provider about going back on the blood thinner. And then Leslie, just to go back to the thrombophilia, just to let you know, because there's different thrombophilias, there's inherited and acquired, and some carry a much higher risk of developing blood clots, as you know. I think we've had some people on these webinars before that have like antithrombin deficiency, those carry a much higher risk. So the reason there's not a big push to to again test is because um, there are such varying degrees. And those ones that are really the highest risk are incredibly rare. So again, going back to, um, to really knowing your risk and talking with your providers. Okay. Here's an interesting question. That's a couple of them, actually. Um, is it safe to have another child if you had a blood clot in your first pregnancy? Yeah, so I think um, absolutely it can be very safe to have another another child. It's really important that um, you get a, a multidisciplinary team to help you. You need a high risk OB. You need um, you know your your hematologist. You need to really explore what your risks are, and it depends. Did you have a life threatening blood clot and you still have twenty seven risks? Well, maybe not. Maybe maybe that's not the right choice for you, but. You know, if um, you know if it seems like the risks uh, are not great, you absolutely. I say to my patients, I don't need to be the first person you call when you get pregnant. You can call your mother, and then you can call me. <laughs> but you know, they need to be started on an anticoagulant as soon as possible. Um, and typically, the dose is going to depend on what are the risk factors they have. Um, at this point, uh, Lovenox or Loma Great Heparin is the one that we use. The direct oral anticoagulants like Eliquis, Ralsa, Savesa. Um, uh, those have not been tested in pregnancy, so we typically do not have patients, um, we do not recommend those, um, but Lovenox is the one to do. And again, the, like I said, the dose is going to depend on all the risk factors that someone has, but definitely we can, we can often get, you know, women just because they've had a blood clot with their first pregnancy does not mean that they cannot have a safe pregnancy going forward. They just need to really have a, a care team um, who is aware and communicating and making sure that everybody's on the same page and they're being treated appropriately. Okay. Uh, does having heterozygous factor V Leiden always mean blood thinners for life? No. So having an inherited risk factor, it doesn't cause blood clots, but it puts people at a higher risk of developing blood clots. And so, um, and when you look at all of the models that kind of predict who's at risk of getting a recurrent blood clot after the first one, those inherited risk factors are not in any of the models. So having factor V Leiden in and of itself is not a reason to keep people on blood thinner for life or long-term. It really has to do with all the other risk factors. It is a risk factor to think about. And oftentimes if I have somebody with a provoked blood clot and factor V Leiden, and there's no other risk factors and I've taken away the, what caused the blood clot. And we, we're trying to move away from provoked. I'm provoked now we say like, was it a risk factor uh, that was transient, um, that has a low risk of recurrence? Um, if that is the case, if they do have like inherited risk factor or family history, I'll often put them on a baby aspirin to kind of as a, as a um, preventative measure. But again, very important that that person in any other high clotting risk situation that I, I will put them back on a low dose of blood thinner during that high clotting risk situation. Okay. Hey, um, Leslie, Leslie. Oh yeah, Heidi. Can I ask a question? Cause I've seen some things, uh, we've talked a lot about anxiety and I have this too. So since we have Rachel, would you mind? Sorry, you know, I, I interrupt you <laughs> no, a lot. No, go right ahead. This is great. Um, so, you know, oftentimes the, I, I travel a lot too for my job and in cars and all that. And I worry about what happens in an accident and how do I notify my doctors and like what really is going to happen if I am in an accident, I'm on Zarelto, how worried should I be? Should I be wearing a bracelet? Should I tell folks? that I'm on a, this blood thinner, how much do I need to share with those people around me so that I stay safe in those situations? Yeah. I usually tell my patients to get a medical alert bracelet because this is the thing. We actually now have reversal agents for almost every type of blood thinner. And so if you were in a car accident, your risk and you, you know, were bleeding, you're going to probably be at a higher risk of bleeding even more because you're on a blood thinner. And there's not really blood tests for some of the blood thinners that people are on, um, especially the direct oral anticoagulants. And so I usually tell people, um, you know, you wear a medical alert bracelet so people will know you're on a blood thinner. And God forbid something does happen, you're in an accident. Um, and I usually have people, it's your name. If you've had a pulmonary embolism, put PE. If you've had a deep vein thrombosis, put BVT. And then the type of the blood thinner you're on. Because again, we do have a reversal agent. And oftentimes if you're, especially if you're traveling, 
they're not going to have your medical records. They're not going to know what you're on. They're not going to uh, know to, what to worry about. So I think there's no downside to having a medical blood bracelet. And, and again, the, the biggest risk of being on a blood thinner is bleeding. And so I tell people, you don't have to live in a bubble, but, you know, just think about it, you know, be, be wary of the risks and, and try not to engage in really high quality and high bleeding risk situations. Um, but I have, you know, I have um, athletes and we often will come up with creative ways to allow them to continue what they want to do um, with, with intermittent use of the blood thinners. But you just got to talk with your providers and make sure that you're on the same page, that you know your risks and that um, you know, if you are somebody that's going to be on it uh, for life, that I often will have people you know, wear that because I do think it's important to know. Heidi, I was going to say, I have a snazzy with <laughs> my Apple Watch. There you I go. absolutely love this thing. I can't go without my Apple Watch. It slides right onto the band. It's yeah. awesome. Oh, yeah. And really you can do a, a bracelet cool. or a necklace. Yeah. I have yeah. a bracelet too for fancier occasions. There you go. <laughs> but I'd rather not wear it. This, I know I'm going to wear my Apple Watch every day. Yeah. And oftentimes when people say, well, I have something in my wallet. And I'm like, you know what? No. If you're in a car accident, no one's going to be rooting around in your wallet. They're going to look at your neck and your wrist and see if you have a medical alert bracelet. That's really going to be the most important thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more question. And then I think we're going to have to... Um, uh, wrap it up for the evening because we've been going for almost an hour and a half. Um, are there any new DOACs on the horizon? Yeah, so there's some factor 11 inhibitors that, have, that are being investigated. Um, they were, there's a big uh, trial that was done in uh, to prevent blood clots in orthopedic surgery. So, and they don't have any risk of bleeding. So I'm very excited to think about those down the line. Um, so that's, that's one that's coming up. Um, so that I think that will be, that will be exciting. And again, I, I will see my patients that are on anticoagulation long-term. I don't like to say lifelong because you never know what's going to happen. At least I usually see them once a year just to go over new information. You know, somebody asked, are there reversal agents for all the DOACs? And there are reversal agents for um, Zeralto and, um, uh, um, sorry, Rivaroxaban and uh, Apixaban. And so, you know, again, meeting with your provider once a year to find out what are, what's new, you know, is there any new oral anticoagulants that I can think about? It, what's my risk? And, and also to address the risk benefit ratio, right? Are you still at a high risk and of, of clotting and which is worse, clotting or bleeding? I usually say to people, you know, it's, it's a balancing act. What's your risk of clotting? off the blood thinner and what's your risk of bleeding on the blood thinner uh -huh. and you have to you have to address that annually and i also think it's really important to have a conversation because oftentimes and and i when i first started way back when like 20 years ago <laughs> i never used to ask about cost like how much people were paying for their anticoagulants and now it's one of the first questions i ask because oftentimes people they can't afford them and so they're not going to take them correctly or they just stop taking them and so that's another reason, again, to, to keep being, make sure that you're talking to people. And sometimes people are embarrassed. They don't want to tell you they can't afford it. You know, unfortunately, every insurance is different. And oftentimes, you know, people will say, well, which blood thinner do you choose? And I say, well, I tell people, what does your insurance cover? <laughs> and then there's some that's, that are twice a day, once a day with food, you know. So it really, it honestly depends on what in, their insurance covers, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, but, um, but really just having that conversation. And if people can't afford it, then you know, we have a prior authorization nurse who really tries to get prior authorization. And oftentimes if they can't afford that, I'll have to you know, choose you know, Coumadin or something um, if, that, you know, if, if we need to do that. So again, I think- um, We do have um, one yeah. more comment, which was, uh, is Rachel accepting new patients via telemedicine <laughs> or can we clone her? Uh, <laughs> I know we can't clone her because we've already tried to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, um, that's great. Thank you for writing yeah, that. Right. Um, so, okay. I, first of all, we just want to say thank you to everybody here tonight. This was unbelievable. Like I could keep going for the next three hours, but I know we all have to go to work tomorrow. Um, so thank you very much to all of you for participating. This was great. And thank you to everybody who showed up tonight. If you have questions, if there are topics that you want us to address in the future, please drop NBCA line at info at stop the clock.org. We would love to hear it because we're here for you. Um, and then just to let everybody know, May is Women's Health Month. Uh, we're rolling out a bunch of new materials specifically for women in blood clots, including our new risk factor checklist, which I think may have been in the chat function, but make sure to come to stoptheclot.org to check that out. And last but not least, um, uh, Heidi would absolutely kill me if I did not mention this. We are super busy advocating um, on Capitol Hill to try and raise awareness, which means increased funding. And part of that is for women in blood clots. There is sadly almost nothing 
that is allocated to the space. And so if you're interested in learning more about how to help to advocate, to get involved, um, either at the federal level or on the state level, please let us know. Again, reach out. Um, she is our advocacy queen, and we're gonna make sure that more money comes to this space for education and awareness. And you guys were just incredible tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Thank having everybody. me. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you.